Blue Regiment proved itself as it has countless times in the past 155 years. In the words of the regimental commander, don't forget, this is a small part of the story. Remember, this was a regimental fight, and all the brothers are brave. This is a story about valor, decisive leadership, and training. Many of the successes of Operation Desert Storm have been attributed to superior armor training. What follows is an account of a battle fought and won by well-trained soldiers using the best military equipment in the world. 25 February 1991, 7th Corps completes a turning movement around the Iraqi position along the Saudi Arabian border and penetrates deep into Iraq, west of the Iraqi Republican Guard. The 1st Armored Division is positioned in the westernmost sector of the Corps, with 2nd Cavalry in a zone to their right. The 3rd Armored Division is behind 2nd Cavalry. Further to the south, the 1st Infantry Division penetrates the Iraqi defensive works and passes the 1st United Kingdom Division through to block the Iraqi tactical reserves. The 1st Cavalry Division conducts a feint in the Wadi al Khan and remains sent down reserve. Two cavalry squadrons cut a supply route known as Phase Line Blacktop. Second squadron sits astride the route on objective gates, and third squadron on objective May, with first squadron in reserve. In the afternoon, airborne platforms report 25 moving vehicles off the right flank of the regiment. Two one attack helicopter battalion, Opcon to the regiment from 1st Armored Division, is assigned the mission of intercepting these moving vehicles and destroying the column. The battalion goes forward with three attack helicopter companies of six attachments, moves eastward in a movement to contact, and engages two T-72 tanks in the village not on their maps. Long Sam handles the operation, and the battalion returns to their assembly area. 26 February 1991, 0216 hours, the regiment, now 120 kilometers deep into Iraq, receives a core flag order to orient to the east. The regiment's zone of operations is adjusted somewhat to the south to prepare to pass the 3rd Armored Division through the regiment's rear, to take up positions between the regiment and the 1st AD to the extreme north. The Corps flag order to the regiment also gives a be prepared mission. Be prepared to pass 1st Infantry Division and assume the Corps Reserve role. The 1st Infantry Division closes on the regimental rear and prepares for the passage of lines. With three squadrons abreast, 2nd Squadron takes the northern sector that joined the 3rd Armored Division. 3rd Squadron is given the center sector and 1st Squadron the southern sector adjoining 1st United Kingdom. Before daybreak, a storm front passes through from the west with severe thunderstorms and torrential rains. Soon, the storms are replaced by fog. Winds from the east begin drying out the upper layers of sand and replacing the fog with a dust cloud of increasing intensity. With the eastern wind comes heavy oil smoke from burning Kuwaiti oil fields. Visibility declines steadily and by noon is cut to only 200 meters. Due to the declining visibility, the second squadron commander occupies only 10 kilometers of sector. Using a box formation, two cavalry troops are placed in the lead, with a cavalry troop and a tank company follow. G troop is assigned the northern sector. To the south, E troop leads. The second squadron commander places F troop and H company behind G and E troop. E troop's southern boundary is shared with I troop of the third squadron. At 1,200 hours, the regiment initiates its move into sector. The 4th Squadron Air Cavalry establishes a screen forward of the regiment. Moving forward into the screening line, the 4th Squadron performs a zone reconnaissance. Entroop encounters the village. Vicinity 0068, encountered earlier by the helicopter battalion. There are two trucks, personnel, and bunkers in and around the village. For a few minutes, the wind dies down and berms occupied by vehicles are seen east of the village. Entry fires 30mm cannons and rockets at the village and berms to the east of it, having machine guns fire in return. Rockets fired by cobras hit just in front of the berms, and the berms are obscured. Due to the intense winds, 4th Squadron is forced to withdraw the screen and grab the aircraft, as is 2-1 aviation. Gale force winds continue to pound the regiment throughout the afternoon. 
Situation Assessment at the Regimental Tactical Operations Center concludes that the regiment had found elements of the Tyrakana Division of the Republican Guard and that it was moving north. The regimental commander orders his squadrons to conduct a movement to contact forward, in sector, to the 70 Eastern, to find and fix the main body of the Tyrakana. The Corps commander's order to not become decisively engaged and to be prepared to pass the first IV remains in effect. Meanwhile, the ground squadrons arrive along the 60 north to south grid line, or eastern, with orders to establish a hasty defense. Engineers push forward to prepare positions. 1525 hours, 26 February. The order to move forward and make contact with the enemy is received. Even with the tremendous intelligence resources available to the Army, the situation for the front line of the regiment remains vague. Maps are old and untrustworthy. They know the enemy is near, somewhere between 65 and 75 instant. Nothing is known of the strength, disposition, or will of the enemy forces. Even the reports of a village held by the enemy have not reached the ground troop commanders. The day will hold many surprises. Troops I and E make contact with a village and enemy soldiers in observation posts along the 68 grid line. In the south, our troop identifies armored vehicles at each of two observation posts forward of them. The I troop fire support officer calls for artillery, then decides that mortar would be most effective in the situation. The mortar proves very successful, and armored vehicles in the observation posts are destroyed. To the north, the E troop sector, the first platoon scout section, receives artillery fire, goes to the open protected hatch, and maneuvers out of the impact area southward toward the village. First platoon then moves back north and continues the mission. 1556 hours, E troop. Third platoon scouts encounter surrendering enemy in a bunker west of the village. Taking prisoners has become almost routine for the soldiers of the regiment. In the past several days, they have encountered numerous bands of Iraqi soldiers, armed and unarmed, who are quite willing to become American prisoners. On the north flank, first platoon scouts make contact with an unknown element in the east. The squad from 3rd platoon moves forward and receives heavy machine gun fire from the village and bunkers around it. The scouts return fire and report. The E troop commander decides to suppress with organic direct fire tanks and continue the mission eastward. Bringing two tank platoons of four tanks each up on the line with his own tank, the commander orders a volley of heat fire into the town. 3rd platoon scouts fire 25mm machine guns and tows. The nearly simultaneous fire from the nine tanks impact into the buildings. Subsequently, fires start and blowing smoke obscures the troop from the enemy. It is now apparent that E and I troop have encountered a forward security element. The observation posts are occupied by infantry squads and the village is garrisoned by infantry. The village is probably the headquarters of an infantry company tasked to provide security forward, where later stockpiles of supplies are found. Each of the enemy observation posts encountered had three vehicle fighting positions. Bunkers enough for an infantry platoon, but only one squad in the position. Apparently, infantry platoons originally occupied these positions. Moments after giving the 3rd Scout Platoon and 2nd and 4th Tank Platoons the ceasefire order on the village, the E Troop Commander sees the 1st Scout Platoon firing to the east. Although his view of the battlefield is limited by an undetected ridge to his direct front, Commander orders the tanks to execute a trained battle drill, so the two tank platoons move forward in a massive tank road. One scout platoon follows, providing rear security and scratching fires to prevent enemy infantry from engaging the tanks with rocket-propelled grenades at close range. The troop has reversed this drill, the assault formation, many times. The commander orders his troop to follow his lead. He doesn't wait for his tank platoons to form on him, but pushes forward. A solitary tank, the point man of the troop. The commander crests the ridge to the front alone, and a